Okay, good morning everybody to B of course BC 106 on interpreting scripture. Thank you for connecting to the class today. We have two hours. Um, let's pray together and then we will get started. I may I request uh, somebody to please unmute your mic and let's take a moment to pray together as a class. Could somebody lead us please? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day. You have given us, Lord, Lord, in the two hours, Lord, whatever we are going to learn from your word, Lord. Lord, it should not be wasted, Lord, but it should be added to our knowledge and we should do your ministry, Lord, more effectively, Lord. Thank you for this day. Lord, give us your guidance, Lord. Give us your wisdom so that we can understand each and every word said by the pastor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Amen, thank you. All right, so last week uh, we started getting into the, uh, the, the practical side of uh, interpreting scripture. Uh, we talked about dependence on the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit illuminates us. Uh, he gives us um, light and understanding into what he inspired in writing uh, uh, many, many years ago through the prophets and apostles. Um, and we looked at that, but we also mentioned that um, uh, just because somebody claims illumination from the Holy Spirit doesn't mean we shouldn't test it or we shouldn't check it uh, according to the normal hermeneutical principles, which is, this is the right way to interpret scripture. So we mentioned that last week when we talked about um, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So uh, so that is something for us to, you know, uh, be careful about. That is, okay, uh, it is true the Holy Spirit inspires and gives us revelation or inspiration, but it also must be tested to make sure it is correct uh, given the normal principles of hermeneutics, which we are covering. Then next, last week, we also spoke about the issue of culture in interpreting scripture. That uh, scripture has to be understood in the cultural context in which it was given. Um, that means uh, certain things were said, written and done because of the culture of the people. And so it has to be understood in that context. What does it mean in that culture? Example, we said in those days, in Bible times, Old, Old Testament times, uh, when two people met to uh, agree on the sale of a land, uh, the person selling the land, I mean, if they agreed to it, he would take off his sandal and give it as a token that this, you know, this sale agreement is done. Now that was very, uh, so you find an example of that in the book of Ruth. Now that was very culture specific because uh, it is not something, you know, we practice today. Now it is in the Bible, it is chapter and verse, but it is culture specific. So we don't do those things today. So like that, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, there are many things. They are in the Bible. There is chapter and verse for it. People at some point practiced it or did it. Or God himself may have told his people to practice it and do it. But it was temporary, like what we said last class. It was a temporary instruction that when it was given to somebody or to a people in a particular time, in a particular culture. So that practice is temporary. It's not permanent. That means we don't do it uh, today. So we went through a list of those things. And in class, we uh, identified some examples. Right. So let me just quickly share that PDF and then we will move forward from there. I'm just quickly uh, reviewing. Right. So we talked about culture, 
these are things that express culture. Some are transferable, some are, so some are permanent, some are temporary. And then we went through this list uh, where we, you know, we're identifying uh, what is temporary, what is permanent. Uh, that means these things, these practices continue today and these some of these practices do not continue today, right? So for example, uh, uh, today, uh, so in the book of Acts, for instance, uh, when they wanted to find somebody to replace uh, Judas Iscariot, uh, this is in Acts chapter one, uh, you know, what they did was they cast lots to find the person who should uh, fill the place of Judas Iscariot. Now, we don't do that today. Why? Because uh, at that time, this was just before the day of Pentecost, um, they didn't have the Holy Spirit to teach them and guide them. Here we are in the New Testament after the day of Pentecost, and God has uh, you know, given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. So today we pray, uh, we ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, we ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom, and then we make choice of uh, uh, leaders and officers in the church. In those days, uh, Acts chapter 1 is an example where, they, where the apostles themselves cast lots to pick out the replacement uh, for Judas Iscariot. So we say that kind of, uh, uh, that is a temporary practice, right? It's not permanent. Uh, it was something they did. Of course, it's in the Bible. Of course, you find chapter and verse for it. But it's not an instruction given to us to keep doing it, right? So it would be wrong, really, uh, for us to, take Acts chapter 1 and verse 26 and say, okay, therefore, every time you want to, you know, find somebody to uh, to fill a certain leadership role in the church, you have to um, cast lots. No, we don't do that. In the book of Acts, later on, uh, they had other criteria. In Acts chapter 6, they said, you know, pick out men who are full of the Holy Spirit or full of good report. And they laid hands on them. They appointed them as deacons. They didn't cast lots. In Acts 14, when they, you know, they went to uh, Paul and Barnabas, when they went to appoint elders in the, many of the churches that they had, new churches they had planted, they, it says, uh, they've prayed and fasted. And then they appointed elders. So it doesn't say anything about casting lots. They only prayed. They sought the mind of God, and then they picked out the people, and they appointed them as elders. So <clears throat> although Acts 1 says they cast lots, as you progress, uh, the way they were doing it was depending on God through prayer and the Holy Spirit. That's how they picked up, the uh, appointed the leaders in the church. So uh, we must you know, be very careful in uh, in. in uh, how we take things and interpret it because sometimes you know and this does happen sometimes people take this Acts chapter one and they say oh that's the way to select a leader no no continue on in the bible uh see what the what the lord has done and uh you know go with what what the what god has given to us in the new testament church okay so that's one important thing to uh understand uh, uh, what is permanent, what is temporary. So we stopped there uh, last week. Uh, we're going to pick up from here and move forward. Uh, before I do that, uh, I just want to see if anybody has any questions about this table of exercises that we did uh, last class. I know we kind of uh, went through it very fast because uh, we were running out of time. Um, okay, Zilatoli. Acts 15.29 says to abstain from blood from things strangled. Why? Um, so um, this is something that God gave um, to his people. And I can think of two reasons. I'm not saying this is the perfect answer, but I can think of these two reasons. One, because uh, Leviticus 17.11 in the Old Testament, God had given the blood as a atonement, as a way to make atonement for sin. So blood uh, symbolizes the life of the animal. 
and, and, and blood is what is given to make atonement for sin. And that's why even Jesus shed his blood. And uh, we say, you know, by the blood, um, we are cleansed, so we are redeemed, and so on. So first, God wanted, uh, I feel that, you know, God wanted his people in the old and in the new there to recognize blood as a means for atonement. It's something special. It represents the life of uh, the sacrifice. Secondly, I also think it's for hygienic purposes, right? So a lot of rules God gave in the Old Testament um, were hygiene. So uh, if you if you read through uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, in the instruction that God gave to His people, uh, He gave certain instructions which were uh, you know, what to eat, what not to eat, how to live in the camp, uh, those kinds of things, which were from a hygiene perspective for the health of the people. So for these two reasons, uh, I think uh, that uh, God told them, don't do this. And so that carries on in um, the New Testament. And uh, so because the blood car you know, has that significance, but uh, obviously um, the blood was misused by other religions. So you know, even in other religions, the blood could be used as part of the worship of idols and idolatry and so on. So the first point, there is a sacredness as, as we understand it, but there is also a misuse in, in, of the blood in the worship of wrong idols things. So when you come to Acts 15, the context there is uh, when they are deciding, you know, uh, Acts 15, 29, which is your question, um, why did the, the council in Jerusalem instruct the new believers, the gen new Gentile believers, to abstain from blood of things strangled? Um, it's because of uh, it doesn't give us the reason, but I'm just trying to, you know, try to understand how they would have approached it. That um, there is this part of sacredness, but there's also this part of it being used to worship idols. Because in Acts 15, they mentioned very clearly, and the worship of idols. So blood was also used in the sacrifice, sacrifices. Uh, right? And Paul repeats that in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, when he talks about um the Lord's table, he says, you know, don't you know that the things that Gentiles offer to idols, they actually offer it to demons. You know, that's in First Corinthians chapter 10. So uh, that's the first reason. And secondly, for hygiene purposes. So that's why we say, okay, you know, that's given, um, uh, you know, uh, there. Now, I like we mentioned last week, uh, uh, in some parts of the world and even in the western world you know if you order a steak they will say you know well done or medium well done or medium rare which means the blood is still there on the on the meat you know so people uh, eat it whether you're even eating a steak there could be this thing so uh, I, I don't think we should um, you know feel like okay we have sinned we've lost our salvation or something no it's just that there, there's a reason why this was given. As long as we are not engaging in that, meaning we are not engaging in a blood sacrifice towards some god, a goddess, and uh, um, uh, hyg hygienically that things are clean, I think we don't need to, you know, be afraid of that. And, you know, and we can't go and tell people to change uh, completely all their diet and so on. So, okay, um, fine. Uh, all right, so we're going to go forward from where we paused last week, and um, we will take up questions uh, as we normally do towards the um, end of each class. So let's go back and uh, continue this. So when we are trying to interpret scripture, keeping culture in mind, um, we ask ourselves some questions. Um, what did the text mean uh, to its immediate readers in that cultural setting, right? And what does the text mean to us now 
in our context, meaning how do I apply that to me? And how much of that cultural aspect do I need to apply today? And what should I leave as purely cultural in nature? Right? So that 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 is what we must do when we're trying to interpret scripture in the cultural setting. That means what did this mean to the people there? And what is it that I need to take away, right? And in order to do that, uh, we have put, you know, some principles and some things, some examples as well. So we will go through this and I think it'll become clear uh, how how to do that, okay? So uh, we use the following principles uh, when we try to determine, you know, which cultural practices and situations are transferable to us today. Right? That means uh, they are permanent and we also should practice them. And which ones are non-transferable? That means it was given to them, it's fine for them, but it's, you know, we don't need to follow it. How do we determine that? Here are, here are some guidance. So number one, some situations or commands or principles are repeated and they are continuous and they are not revoked. So they are repeated, they are continuous, and they are not revoked. And uh, usually this would be in relation to moral, that is uh, the way of life, and the theological meaning things about God. So then we would say that's permanent and transferable, such things. What would be some examples? For instance, uh, capital punishment, that means death for death. Uh, it has not been revoked anywhere in the Bible, so it is transferable. It is okay that, you know, uh, of course, today we have uh, the judicial system in every country. And in many countries, I, I can't say this for everyone, but for many countries, there is capital punishment. That means uh, if you do certain crime, and of course there are the laws and uh, uh, things that are judged by, it could lead to capital punishment, right? And so in scripture, we find that death for death. And it has not been revoked, it's still there, and so it's perfectly fine. Now, think about something else. Polygamy. Now that was practiced in the Old Testament. But the New Testament explicitly or very clearly instructs monogamy. That means it is overdoing or, or say it's replacing or undoing what was in the Old Testament. So when you come in the New Testament, the Bible says that every man be the husband of one wife. You know, very clear. And we, we have the scriptures here. So this is an example where something was practiced in the Old Testament, but it is clearly and explicitly revoked at a later point in time. Or think about something else. Uh, a Nazarite in the Old Testament, and, and this is more of a cultural thing, we don't have to fight about it, but I'm just giving it as an example. A Nazarite in the Old Testament, he was not supposed to cut his hair. That means he was so consecrated to God, uh, this was part of his lifestyle. He wouldn't cut his hair, that means his hair just grew. But in the New Testament, and this is not a rule, but a comment that is made. Paul, in the context of that culture, he says, long hair is considered dishonorable. And again, that is this is also uh, part of the culture. I'm not saying that today God is telling us how long, whether we should have long hair or short hair, but he's just saying that, you know, uh, for men, uh, uh, it's not typical to have long hair, right? But 
for a man who chooses to be an Nazarite, he's going to let his hair grow. Right now, I'm just showing the difference. I'm not saying either one is a rule uh, today. You know, each one can do as they, they wish with their hair. It's up to them. But I'm just showing this difference. Right? So within the scriptures, we look and see, uh, has the Bible revoked anything? Uh, and the Bible will set its, will place the limit on what is supposed to be cultural and what is not. And so we go with what the Bible says. But let's look at some more examples. Um, another principle here, when we're trying to determine whether there is something that is um, specific to culture or not, is some situations, commands or principle are very specific to an individual, meaning it's not given to every person. Therefore, it is non-repeatable. And usually this has to do with things that are you know, not establishing theology or a way of life, but it is uh, more specific to that individual's walk with God. Example is God told Abraham to take up his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. Now, Abraham is the father of faith. We know that and we are supposed to follow uh, the example of Abraham. Does that mean all of us have to, you know, take our firstborn and go up to Mount Moriah and uh, offer our firstborn as a sacrifice or something like that? No, no, no. It would be a complete uh, misapplication because what God told Abraham to do was very specific to the individual, that is to Abraham, and it was meant for him uh, concerning his walk with God, and therefore it is not transferable for us today. So like that, uh, when in, in God's dealings with people throughout the Bible, you know, whether it was Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Moses or so on, in their lives, we have to distinguish what was God's uh, specific dealing to them, uh, which was for their walk with God, and uh, which is, you know, but yet we can learn from Abraham's obedience example. So in this case, God told Abraham, go offer your son, your only son, Isaac. Okay, that is not transferable. But the principle behind it, behind Abraham's action is transferable. So what do you mean? Well, when Abraham obeyed that instruction and he went up the mountain, uh, went up to Mount Moriah to offer us an Isaac. He was walking in faith and he was walking in obedience. So the principle is transferable. God wants us to follow that, uh, his example, not the specific command. Right? So that's another example where something is Temporary in nature, but the principle is transferable to us. A few more scenarios. Number three, when we're talking about, you know, interpreting scripture in the context of culture, another thing to keep in mind is that there are similar situations, uh, similar situations. That means it, it situations today may not be exactly the same as then, but they are similar. So the practice will not be the same, but the principle is transferable. So the practice is not the same, but the principle is transferable. So example is, take you know, the New Testament church the gathering of believers and take gathering of believers today. Of course, it is similar. Believers gathered then, believers gathered now. Now, when believers gathered in the New Testament, uh, we saw this last class, 
Paul instructs, you know, for example, in Romans 16, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. So greet one another with a holy kiss. So, of course, there is chapter and verse for it. Uh, does that mean today also we have to explicitly follow that same practice? Or do we follow the underlying principle? You know, what are we supposed to follow? Now, there's chapter and verse that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Settings are quite similar. The gathering of believers. We still have gathering of believers today. We practice that. But when we greet each other, or for that matter, in different, in different parts of the world, how they greet each other can happen in different ways. Some may shake hands, some may give a hug, some may, you know, just the greetings can be very, you know, in different expressions. So the underlying principle is uh, you greet each other as uh, to express your love, your kindness, your warmth, etc. It's not that it has to be done with a holy kiss. No, it could happen in different ways. The principle is you greet each other. How you practice it, it will vary from place to place. So in such situations, we should think about not imposing the same practice, but in transferring the principle. And then some examples will be that uh, neither the practice nor the principle, neither the practice nor the principle needs to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess the principle will, will be there, but the practice doesn't have any similarity to us. Uh, but the principle is understood and the principle is transferred. Example would be, Moses, you know, when he encounters God, he sees the burning bush. And God says, Moses, take your sandal off. Now, does that mean every time we go to prayer, we have to take our sandals off? Does it mean every time we sing, worship, uh, or, you know, gather together, we have to take our sandals off? No, we don't do that, but the principle is hey, you have reverence for the presence of God. Hey, that's, that's, the, that's the key thing. It's, that's the underlying thing uh, that we all have. It's not, taking, it's not about taking off our sandals. So you can pray with your shoes on. You can worship with your shoes on, your footwear on. But the important thing is to have reverence for God. So we don't force people, you know, hey, Moses, God told you, you know, God told Moses, you are standing on holy ground, take off your sandals. Therefore, everybody, every time you pray, wherever you pray, you have to take your sandals off. We don't impose that. And because that was given to Moses in that moment, in that setting, uh, it's not something everybody does. And you don't find it, you know, practiced elsewhere. And similarly, and we, this is a passage, you know, we will talk about some difficult questions towards the end of the this course. Uh, after we have gone through, you know, uh, all the principles, we will pick up some difficult passages. Uh, and one of those passages, you know, usually is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, whether a woman should cover her hair or not. So now today I will just give a very brief uh, thing on this and if you you know, maybe later on towards the end of the course, when we pick up the difficult passages, uh, we can get into it a little bit more. But uh, should a woman cover her head or not? You know, so that uh, that is a big discussion. I mean, at least in uh, in some parts of the world, I'm not I'm not sure it's a big discussion everywhere, but in some parts of the world, and definitely in uh, our part of the world. Um, I've had, uh, you know, deal with this. People will come and, you know, ask this, why are people not covering their head and so on? Now, in general, I mean, okay, let's understand 
1 Corinthians 11. There, Paul was addressing a particular um, people in a particular culture. He was addressing the believers at Corinth in their setting, in the Corinthian setting. So what do we know about the Corinthian setting? Corinth was a place of a great a big idolatry and a lot of prostitution associated with the temples. And uh, as a sign of uh, uh, that somebody was a prostitute, uh, they didn't cover their head and they, sh they, sh they uh, what do you call it? They shaved their head. That was a sign. Now, uh, some of these people have gotten saved. And now they are coming to the Christian church. They have come out of that background. They're coming to the Christian church. So that is the background. That is the context. And so in that context, Paul is saying it's good for a woman to have hair on her head, and uh, uh, and uh, you know, and then she covers her head. So he's speaking to women in their context. And he's saying it's good to do this. He also says that it is a symbol. It's a sign of you being submitted as unto God. But he does not make it a rule because he ends that passage in 1 Corinthians 12. Sorry, in 1 Corinthians 11. He concludes that by saying, if any man has any questions or is contentious about this, uh, we do not have such practices in our other churches. That means he's saying, look, I am writing this to you specific to the Corinthian church, but this is not something we practice everywhere in all our other churches. We're not telling everybody else to do this. So that is in a sense, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, we can read the text, you know, and later on uh, when we have time uh, towards the end of the course. But the, so the point is, something like you know, head covering for women can be understood to be very cultural, very specific to the Corinthian church in their context because of certain reasons um, that had to do with the cultural setting. That's why he was. Now, today, we don't enforce it on everybody. Like we don't tell everybody, every woman who comes to church, you have to cover your head. Now, if somebody wants to cover their head, that is their choice. If they want to wear a hat or they want to wear a shawl or they want to wear something else on their head, that is entirely up to them. But we don't force it, you know, as for various reasons. People may want to cover their head. It's up to them. But we don't force it as a rule. Okay. So going back, let's just quickly review. So when we want to, you know, interpret scripture text, Taking into account culture, we are asking us two questions, or we are just thinking through. What did this mean to the people in that time? You know, why was it given? So like we interpreted 1 Corinthians 11, there was a reason why Paul had to talk about head covering to that particular church. There's a reason, there's a background, there's a cultural context to it. So we need to understand that. Uh, what is the what is what is the problem he's trying to address? And then we have to say, okay, what is the meaning we uh, for us today? Like, how, how do we transfer it uh, in our day and time for us to use? And uh, then we transfer, so then we can understand. You know, we see, we look for that. Uh, the other things we also look for is has something been revoked? Or is it permanent, right? If something has been revoked, then we don't enforce it today. Uh, if something uh, uh, is left as it is, then we say, okay, we will continue its practice. Uh, some things we say, okay, was it given just for that individual or was it given for everybody? Well, you can say, well, it was given for that individual, then it, we shouldn't enforce it on everybody. It was given for them, but we can learn from their example and follow their example. Uh, uh, and uh, in some cases, like we saw in three and four, uh, the we may not practice the same thing, but the principle uh, is what we practice. The underlying principle is what we should look for. 
Okay, so let me pause here and just take up any questions if anybody needs any clarification uh, on this, you know, interpreting scripture in the context of the culture in which it was um, given. Any questions on this? Or if, uh, if you think of any passage um, that you feel we should discuss, um, we could take it up. Yeah, everyone's okay so far? Yes, Pastor. But we are okay, Pastor. Out okay. of curiosity, Pastor. Yes, yes. Um, Go ahead. So from, uh, we see in a traditional Christian culture in um, India, and especially South India, we see uh, people uh, you know, covering their head. Just out of curiosity, uh, any idea how it came into existence? Hmm. Yeah. Um, see, I know, I know, because it has happened in some of our conferences, um, where uh, there are certain traditions, church traditions, where they take First Corinthians eleven and they say, "See, it's written there, so you have to practice it." You know, and so um, there are certain church traditions, maybe certain Pentecostal traditions, where they take First Corinthians 11, and they say it's written there, Paul said you have to cover your head. So therefore, everybody has to cover, I mean, all the women have to cover their head. And they practice that. Now, I don't, I'm not going against it. I don't, you know, I don't try to waste time. I mean, if you want to cover your head, it's up to you. Uh, but, uh, and I don't try to argue with them because sometimes, uh, you know, it becomes a very difficult argument. So I don't say, let's not even waste time on this. Uh, but uh, that's where it comes from. That is, they take that text literally and they don't look at it as, okay, this is something that was given to the Corinthian believers because of their culture. They don't look at it that way. They look at it like, hey, it's written in the Bible. You have to do it. So uh, it's okay, you know, if uh, it's anyway, it's nothing big, you know, you're just covering your head, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but that's how it comes, and that's how it's still being enforced, you know, so they will still preach uh, to their people. First Corinthians 11 is written, you have to do it, but they don't interpret it the way we are talking about, you know, interpreting it in the light of culture, uh, what's temporary, what's permanent, so that practices continuing yeah yes first, thank you yeah. uh nicholson please go ahead with your question yeah pastor i just wanted like clarity personally i've heard of a lot of people who've taken this nazarene oath and even uh, i know one person personally as well who has taken it now would of course uh, we know in the new covenant it, it doesn't make too much sense but should we correct them and tell them, like with the head covering thing, uh, should we correct them and say, go cut your hair or just let them be? <laughs> what would you suggest? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I would just uh, see if somebody wants to do it, that's their personal choice. Um, we can ask them, hey, we can try to talk to them saying, look, see, you know, in the New Testament, we don't need to do these things right we have to live by faith and uh, depending on the holy spirit so we don't need to do these things um, but if they choose to do it we let them it's their choice between them and god we let them do it the only thing i would become concerned is if they start forcing others to do it or they try to tell others you also have to do this then that becomes a problem Right. But as long as they're not, you know, um, uh, putting that on other people, it's just a personal decision they have made. They want to stay like that. It's okay. We will leave them alone. Although, you know, it's okay to have a conversation with them and say, look, you know, uh, really, you don't need to do this. Just have faith in what Jesus did and uh, live by the spirit and live by the word of God. That's enough. Uh, we can have a conversation. If they, if they insist that, you know, they want to do it, it's their choice. We leave them alone. 
uh, just that we should make sure they don't uh, <laughs> start forcing others. You know, others should not come under pressure or under uh, condemnation that uh, I'm not doing what he's doing. No, that shouldn't happen. Other than that, we just leave them alone. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next chapter. So you know, first principle, culture. Okay. Um, Tobiloba, uh, your question, please. Thank you, sir. Please, I want a clarification, sir. In our own culture here, even before the Christianity came in. We believe in covering, we believe that woman must cover his, uh, her head, sorry, must cover her head, one of, is one of our culture, mm. before the Christianity came in. And we discover that this culture is similar to that Corinthian culture. And we have some cultures that didn't that follow that, follow suit. And we now, before uh, uh, our, our forefather in Christianity in this land preached that we must cover our head, especially women, when they are praying or for the to, to respect their husband. Mm. But nowadays, our ministers are copying other culture to preach that it's not necessary to cover their head. I want the clarification, uh, what is the impact of culture in our religion as a Christian? Is mm. it necessary to follow our culture? Whether well, one of our culture is good, because this um, is, a, is a way of showing our morality in our society. So if any woman open uh, uncover her head, the sign of whether, whether it's not under husband or it's a prostitute. That's mm. our own belief. Is he, uh, what is the relationship between the culture and the and the Christianity in mm. terms of uh, all of this issue? So that's the mm. one I want to clarify. Mm, mm, mm. Right. Um, what we can see in the New Testament. And uh, just as a reference, uh, I'm thinking of passages like uh, Romans chapter 14. And I'm also thinking of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that Paul talks about how he went about doing his ministry. Uh, if you look at these passages, uh, the essence of it is, as long as the culture is not telling us to do anything wrong, as long as the culture doesn't contradict the Bible, Keep the culture because that helps us relate to the people where we are. It is only when if the culture contradicts the teaching of the Bible, then we follow the teaching of the Bible. The teaching of the Bible will supersede that practice in culture. But otherwise, uh, as long as the culture doesn't contradict the Bible, then keep it, follow it, continue it. So, for example, uh, like you're saying, uh, uh, in, in your culture, it's, it, it, was, it was already a practice for women to cover their head. Well, there's nothing wrong in it. The Bible is not saying don't do it. Uh, what we are saying is uh, we don't force everybody to to do it, but if somebody wants to do it or somebody's already doing it, perfectly fine, it doesn't matter. We don't have to tell them to go and undo it. We can only let them know that, look, as far as scripture is concerned, it's not a requirement for women to cover their head. But if women want to cover their head, it's fine. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, for practical reasons, uh, everybody covers their head, you know. Uh, so, you know, if it's very cold and then you want to wear a hat, men and women may wear hats, okay? Cover the head and uh, worship God because it's very cold. No problem. It's just a practical thing. So, you know, uh, if the weather is very cold, 
everybody will keep trying to stay warm. So, so, uh, so we, we, we're just saying there is freedom here, but uh, do whatever your culture permits to do, as long as it's not contradicting the Bible. And in this case, it's not contradicting the Bible. So, for example, uh, in some places, it's just part of the tradition that they remove footwear before they go into the place of worship. So the Bible is not saying you have to do that. No, it is already there. It's just part of tradition. They leave their footwear out and then they enter the place of worship. And in some cases, maybe it's just a practical thing that they don't want to dirty the place to keep cleaning it. So they may tell everybody, please leave your footwear outside and then come inside. Maybe it's just a practical thing. So we don't need to change that. Leave it. Uh, because it really doesn't matter. But we're not forcing people to do it because you know, of something in the Bible. The Bible is not forcing us. But if it's already there and it's a good thing, uh, we leave it like that. Okay, so that's how you make the decision. So the basic principle is, if there are things in the culture which don't contradict the teaching of the Bible, best to leave it because then we're able to relate to the people. And if you look at First Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says very clearly, you know, as he went preaching the gospel, he said, to the Jew, I became like a Jew. To the Gentile, I became like, you know, the Gentile. To those who were under the law, I became as under those without the law. So he says, I became like them. That means I entered into their world. I adapted to what they were living in and I brought the gospel to them. You know, he didn't go and tell them, you change and, you know, then I will bring the gospel. No. He just went in where they were. But he said in First Corinthians 9, he was in subjection to the law of Christ. So he was not contradicting his submission to Christ while he was reaching people just the way they were, where they were. You know, so that's a good uh, uh, practice, a good principle to follow. Is that okay? Did I answer your question to Bilaba? Very correct, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Very good questions. And anything else? Okay. So uh, it's almost a break time. Um, what we're going to do, just to let you know uh, uh, what we will try to cover uh, after break, and then we will. So we've, uh, we've uh, gone through this part on culture. Then what we want to talk about is grammar. Right, so grammar, uh, the meaning of the word, and then also the figure of speech. Right, so we want to uh, understand that part when we're looking at scripture, and um, maybe if we get time, we'll get into types and shadows. Uh, how do we understand types and shadows? So let's uh, see if we can do that um, after a break. Right, so let's take a break, and uh, uh, we'll come back in ten minutes and. Resume. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 